specifically, uh, including myself. And what we'll do is we'll let this go for about um, uh, five or ten minutes or so, and then from there we'll start to wrap up the innovation forum. So would anybody like to pose the first question? Gail, would you like to go first? No. Oh, no. <laughs> OK. I know Doug Pascoe would love to ask the first question. Doug, do you have a good? Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. It's always hard to get the first one underway. To Linda, I'm always amazed by the way the media companies succeed in getting clients. And uh, um, my wife has a car and it's tuned to your radio station and she doesn't quite know how to get rid of it. And uh, <laughs> I wonder whether that sort of thing is widespread and whether that could be used as the greatest marketing ploy in the century. Get rid of the car? Or the <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think certainly people's uh, adaptability to technology is, is one of the challenges, if you like, um, which is why we're not going to abandon the radio business very quickly. Uh, it's certainly the uh, business that, that um, generates the most money, which is... But at the same time, you do have to look to the future if you just stay looking after your, your current business and there's all this technology happening around, then um, it's just not going to, you, you're just going to die, you, you, you're living short term. Which is why Osterio has created a whole division of multimedia and really I was in Sydney last week and went downstairs and uh, the, the, the guy who's head of the multimedia department I'm quite uh, friendly with and I said, oh how's the Empire Builder going? And he jumped a mile because he was in the process of writing yet another job description for yet another recruitment. So um, uh, this division, Osterio has made a decision to put its, it, uh, invest, I guess, its money into that. It doesn't expect a return for some time, uh, although they're starting to push us to sell it. But we've already recognised that our, it needs a, its own sales force, really. So our own sales people will be selling radio and we'll gradually create a multimedia team. And the reason for that is, is that you go into an agency and there's people there who have no understanding of the new media platforms and then there's other d parts of the agency who that's all they do. So they're actually different people that we need to talk to. But certainly technology, people's adaptability of technology is a is um, is always going to uh, um, limit what we can do to some extent, but as Greg just said about his son jumping on MSN, my son sons do that too. Uh, the different that they listen to music at the same time, and they talk about music. Uh, music is just the fabric of their life. And it really, when you think about it, I can remember back studying for my leaving certificate, listening to the radio at the same time. Well, they do that too, and they s live stream. I mean, we get letters from people all around the world who listen to 94.5 um, on their on their on their uh, things. So it's about how people actually adapt, and you've got to have a business that addresses all those different. Uh, levels of expertise and, and comfort zones, really, and um, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thanks for the question, Doug. Uh, any other questions from the floor? I was just uh, wondering, uh, one of the themes today has been um, people in technology, and just for anyone on the panel to comment on, as as um, the demographics of your organisations change in, in age, how do you, how do you, or what strategies do you have to tap into to, uh, individual attributes to embrace technology and change and be innovative? Do you have any you know, specific strategies to, to help people, you know, come, come to grips with that, that, that challenge, in, in the face of servicing customers as well? Um, I can answer some of that from a radio point of view because obviously the emerging technologies is not just. Uh, radio is just technology. It's it's people drive it all the time. And I have two radio stations, um, one of which the average age seems to be about 12, and the other age is about uh, 40. And so they've got very different 
levels of adaptability in some respects. Um, having said that, the, the jocks are 94.5, um, never make any mistakes in running the technology and they, they, we're, we're changing our technology often. We're just about to change our um, computerised music selection technology. Uh, Perth is miles behind all the other states and we're about to move, in, move into new premises in 12 months time with new de digital technology and we thought we could wait but we can't because everything's held together with band-aids and lackey bands and the young guys in 92 um, they're just it's just that young thing they think they know everything before they know anything and um, so they're constantly calling the techs in on the weekends and really it's just about user things so we've we've got an issue about servicing the problem not solving the problem sometimes when it comes to user technology so we have to train our young guys we have to make them be a little bit uh, less more patient a uh, little bit more attention to detail they know that it's not someone else's job it's their job thanks Linda um, either Rob or Colin perhaps just a quick quick comment from me got it is that all? Yeah, it will yep. come. Um, Tony, thanks for that question. And uh, Tony's actually uh, one of my colleagues in licensing, and uh, Tony would be able to answer this better than I would. He, uh, he actually runs our contact centre, which is where all the calls come in, and uh, he's a bit of an expert on our technology anyhow, and I'm not. <coughs> I think the simple answer from my perspective, but is that licensing, and if I can steal a, a saying from a, um, one of the high-profile Perth coaches, um, licensing's on a journey. I hope we're just a bit more successful than what Fremantle is. <laughs> um, but uh, we are on a journey. Uh, our licensing's been a bit of an uncared for, unloved uh, child in government for a long, long time. Um, just put aside and just leave it alone. But uh, when you think it's a bit of a cash, when you re realise how, what a cash cow it is for government uh, at, a, at a pretty, at a relatively small cost to government, um, it, uh, it has a lot of potential. What we've also got is a very ageing workforce. We've got some great loyal people that work in our licensing business that have been there since since Adam was in nappies, you know, it's just so long that uh, people just know the business backwards. And they're not used to some of the technology that we need now to be embracing, uh, the, the new business channels that we need to be introducing into our licensing business to actually get it to a modern environment, which is still not. So it's a challenge for us and, and part of it will be about our recruitment of the, of the right people, particularly the younger folk uh, um, through our graduate uh, recruitment we're doing, through our trainee uh, program recruitment we're doing and just training generally. So it's, it's a challenging one for us in licensing and, and as I say, Tony knows that uh, as well as anybody. Thanks for that, Colin. Yeah, Greg, I'd probably just make a comment, Tony. I think it, it is a good question. And it goes back to, and Linda mentioned it, and Rob as well, and that's training. But now I think we've got to think differently about how we deliver training. I think for the older generation, we thought training was you go to a training course. Now that's not necessarily so. In my presentation I mentioned towards the end about mentoring. We're a medium-sized organisation of 40 and we certainly have a diverse range of age groups, myself being at the top and being less used to technology. But it is about identifying who has what skills and in that training it might be a buddy system, a mentoring system, but acknowledging the skills that are there and then sharing that uh, around either in a formal situation or, as I say, in a buddy-type situation. I'll just relate a little story to you about those in the older age group. Some years ago, about 10 years ago, I was working with a fellow who, in fact, at that stage was 58 years of age. It was a mechanic, uh, bad back, so the story goes. He uh, eventually went for a position at Coventry Motors in terms of the spare parts. And he went there, he came back to me after the first day and he said, you didn't tell me that I had to deal with IT. And I said, <laughs> right, I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I said to them, you know, if I'd known it was IT, I, I would not have uh, really applied for the job or come looking. And the thing that I had said to him when, of course, he went looking for the job, don't go tell him you're 58. Tell him you're looking for somewhere where you can spend the next seven years. So the response back to him was, that's all right. You've got seven years to learn. <laughs> And that really, I think, is what it's about. It's about how we're changing our thinking and our culture towards how we use the word training. To cite um, a couple of case scenarios, to deal with the uh, ageing population, um, organisations like Castrol, for example, they realise they have a lot of mature technical experts who are exiting the workplace. And what they've set up is uh, an environment that they're calling the seniors. 
and they come back on a part-time basis and act in customer support through technical online. So what the organisation is finding that is that they have a social and a community responsibility in order to maintain the well-being of their ex-staff. Uh, so what they're doing is they're inviting those people back on a uh, permanent part-time or a casual sort of basis. Um, Hewlett-Packard in Singapore, uh, what they've done is they've set up a mentoring program. So typically you think of mentoring program as somebody who is older mentoring somebody who is younger. But because it's a technology-based organisation, what they're doing is they're finding that the uh, the, the younger people are more technolo technologically savvy than the older people, so the mentoring in reverse, that they're getting those people that are more competent mentoring those people that are less competent with technology. And as it turns out, the younger people are mentoring the older people. So it comes down to strategy, it comes down to industry, and it comes down to what is it that you're trying to achieve. But at the end of the day, it's about um, having the right attributes and it's about focusing on competence and commitment for those. Okay, any other questions? Maybe just one final question, uh, Bill, from the City of Perth. Uh, thanks, Greg. Thanks. Um, just perhaps a uh, comment uh, from the panel. Uh, what can organisations do in the emerging trend for young people to move on seeking challenges all the time? What's the best way organisations will be able to address the continuity question and building some strength uh, without losing some of that expertise. Okay, maybe I'll extend that to Colin to, to respond. <laughs> and Louis, I think that is one of the big issues, as I was saying earlier, that we know as I've grown up, uh, it's certainly about being loyal to an employer. Now, I think that is the thing that confronts us, Bill. I mean, I have it at the moment where I am taking managers, sorry, uh, taking senior staff who want to get into management, giving them those skills it's a risk because once people have developed those skills they may wish to look elsewhere and to move on and upwards. Uh, it's a risk but I believe that um, as we hear it's about the environment that you're working in, it's about how you treat your staff, it's not about, uh, if you look at research, it's not about money necessarily. When people talk about what, are the, what is the most important th thing to them when they're working, money I think is about fifth. It is about being acknowledged it is being about looked after. It is about creating a good environment to work. And I think you've got to look at all of those things to ensure that people will stay with you. But of course, as we well know now, when I started, and I started in the public service, it was for life. Now when employers are looking at people, if you've stayed in a job for too long, they think you've gone stale. You need to keep moving on. So I think you've got to manage the two of keeping people as long as you possibly can, but realising that you need to also look beyond that for others, which is why I said in my presentation, it's not only about you, the employer, it's about you, the industry. If we look at trades particularly, we know we've had an issue for decades and probably go on for a lot, lot longer. But we do need to think about it in more the macro area, I think, to address that sort of issue, Bill. Um, is that, would anybody else like to Maybe just a quick comment. I don't think there's any simple answer to that, Bill, but uh, for me, it's about pr providing uh, people with opportunities, uh, providing them with challenges, and they've just got to have a work environment that they enjoy working in. Uh, a lot of people will stay, as Colin said, um, for more than money and uh, enjoying their workplace uh, and having those other challenging and uh, rewarding opportunities can make a difference. And if I could just, just make a comment, because I mentioned in my um, uh, presentation that very few people in radio have uh, been to university, which is true. Uh, one of the things that, that I find I'm quite proud of in a in a vicarious kind of way. Um, about five of my staff, all young women, um, have all started either postgraduate degrees or um, are doing a degree part time uh, as of this year to to doing their MBAs. Um, uh, one doing a communications degree, another one doing her CPA. So. We're, we've actually, I think, I see that as evidence of us creating an environment where we are trying to encourage people to expand their horizons um, and in, a, in a, an altruistic way make them less vulnerable um, to the vagaries of the radio industry which has highly specialist people who uh, may not be able to do anything else if it didn't if they didn't have that. So we're, that, that to us is, is a, it's a very, radio is a very um, immature 
organisation in the sense in a, in a, is an in, immature industry in the sense it's run uh, through great passion and enthusiasm and um, very little sophistication and uh, from a career point of view. So we've tried to actually open that up a little bit and make people more aware of what goes on outside of them, outside in the outside world. And by that we hope that it also gives them greater job satisfaction. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together for Linda Collins and Rob.